The contents of the following program are not intended to substitute for the advice of your health care provider, and the producers of this series assume no liability for the use or misuse of the material presented. Creation or evolution? Design or random chance? They say it all began with a big bang. But when we look at the amazing human body, the answer is obvious. The complexity of the design exceeds anything man has ever made. The body could only have been designed by the master designer we read about in the Bible. Divine Design. Hello, I'm Patty Barnes, director of the midwifery program at Heartland College. There are several amazing transitions that take place at birth in both the mother's body and the baby's. We'll discuss the mother's changes later, but for now, let's look at some of the transitions that have to take place in the baby in order for him or her to survive. After all, the baby is going to undergo a drastic change from the mother's womb, which he has been comfortably living in for the past nine months in a world of water, an environment that could, none of us could survive in, to an outside world, a world of air. And the baby is also going to transition from a constant climate to an ever-changing one. This is something that man with all his intelligence and brilliance could never develop, and it certainly could not happen by chance. Folks, there's a divine hand that is guiding in this. In Psalm 71, 6, we read, By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. Is this just nice poetic language here? Or is this telling us that God does something special as the baby is coming out of the womb? Right at birth, a miraculous change must take place in the baby's circulatory system. Remember, all along, the placenta has been supplying the functions of the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, and carrying away waste and carbon dioxide, while supplying the oxygen and necessary nutrition. In other words, the placenta has been the life support system for the baby. Now that is about to come to an end, and because it will end, there must be a rearranging of the baby's circulatory system. Up until now, the blood has been bypassing the liver and the lungs. You might roughly compare this to driving down the highway and seeing a sign that says, road closed ahead. You are forced to take a detour for a while until you merge back into the highway. This is what the blood has done, detouring around these major organs while the placenta was temporarily performing their functions. These detours are called shunts. Another way of looking at this is to think of the path of least resistance. The resistance into the liver and lungs has been high, therefore restricting the flow through them. The blood was flowing freely through the shunts and to and from the placenta because the resistance was quite low. At birth, the road close sign is removed and the traffic is able to continue straight through the liver and the lungs where the resistance has now fallen due to the amniotic fluid being displaced and the blood vessels expanding. Another miracle of creation is the restriction of blood flow in the umbilical cord. A strong muscle-like tissue that surrounds the cord begins contracting, clamping down on it. There is an amazing substance called Wharton's jelly that has been serving a very important role while the baby was in the womb. This jelly-like material has helped prevent the cord from kinking and pinching off the blood flow, so necessary for the baby's survival. Now this jelly serves a different and opposite purpose. After being exposed to the cold air, it begins to condense and harden. The result is a restriction of the blood flow. 
to and from the baby. This prevents excessive blood loss for both the baby and the mother. By the way, did you know that the baby's cord blood contains iron, immune building red and white blood cells, and stem cells that benefit the baby? That is why more and more studies suggest not clamping the cord immediately after delivery, but waiting for a minute or two or until the cord stops pulsating. This helps brain development, increases immune function, and may prevent anemia in the first year of life. When the cord gets clamped and severed, the blood flow is completely channeled back into the arteries. Gradually, the shunts or bypasses begin to shrink and disappear. Now all the plumbing is reorganized so that the baby's organs can do all that the placenta was doing. All this takes place in a matter of minutes. As you can see, this is just not possible with evolution. Charles Darwin admitted in his book on the origin of species. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find out no such case. Darwin, living in the mid-1800s, obviously knew nothing of the miracle of childbirth. Here, his theory does, indeed, absolutely break down. Not just once or twice, but countless times. One little glitch in this process, and there is no baby and no second chance to get it right. But hold on. Just getting the plumbing right doesn't answer the question of why the baby begins breathing. Science still has not determined exactly why the baby takes its first breath. What triggers the baby to begin breathing? If he doesn't breathe, the rerouted blood flow through the lungs won't solve the oxygen issue. There are several theories about how this happens, and here are just a few. The sudden exposure to cold air causes a gasping reflex. Hormonal influences may play a part. The respiratory nerve center is triggered by stimulation. The change in pressure on the chest from the womb to the air. An increased level of carbon dioxide. Perhaps all these are contributing factors and we will probably learn more as research continues. Friends, this is evidence of an incredible design, not mindless chance. In Colossians 1.16, it says of Jesus, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Only our all-wise Creator could have engineered all these things. But wait, we're not finished yet. There is another major obstacle that the baby has to overcome, or all this nine months of incredible growth and development is for nothing. We've got to get the seven or eight pound baby to fit through a tiny hole. But don't worry, God didn't bring us this far to leave us. He anticipated and planned for this ahead of time. In his infinite wisdom, he made the baby's skull in such a way to help fit it through this tight squeeze. Let's take a brief look at this wonder of creation. The baby's skull has five main bones or plates that have a special feature to aid in delivery. They are the occipital bone at the back of the head, two parietal bones on either side, and two frontal bones that make up the forehead. All these bones are connected together by sutures. These sutures are joints, which in a baby are flexible, even allowing the overlapping of one bone over the other. Where two or more of these sutures come together, it is called a fontanelle, or a soft spot, allowing for even more flexibility. This flexing process is called molding. Not only does it allow flexibility, but even a slight reduction in size, making it easier for the head to pass through the birth canal. This is the reason why babies are born with slightly cone-shaped heads. They eventually will reshape 
and the fontanelles will close as the child grows older. Well, this helps, but it still appears that there's an impossible task ahead. The birth canal is simply too tight to squeeze the baby's head through. This is where God made a wonderful provision with the mother's pelvis. First, something must be done about the pelvic floor, though. Muscles from all different directions are anchored to the coccyx, which, by the way, proves that it's not just a useless organ. This pelvic floor supplies a base, like a sling, that keeps our organs from dropping down. So this mass of muscles and tissues stand in the way of the baby's passage. How in the world is he going to get past all that? The problem is solved. At this point, the mother is producing more hormones that will soften the muscle tissue. When the baby's head descends, a combination of contractions and pressure from the head will cause the cervix to dilate. Then further contractions help push the baby's head through the softened pelvic floor. We'll talk more about dilation and effacement in a later segment. But here the baby runs into yet another obstacle. He gets past all the muscle structure only to run into the bones of the pelvis. Now what? The female pelvis is formed differently than the male's. Where the male's is more narrow and funnel shaped, the woman's is like a bowl. In fact, the Latin word for pelvis is basin. It is made up of three major bones, two ilium bones and a sacrum. A fourth smaller bone is located at the base of the sacrum, which we all know is a coccyx. Notice the three joints are ligaments that connect the major bones to where the iliums and sacrum meet, and one at the bottom where the ischiums, which are the lower parts of the iliums, come together. We can all be glad for these joints as they allow a degree of flexibility and shock absorbance when we run, jump, or fall. But this flexibility is pretty limited. At birth, however, another miracle of design is set in motion. The mother secretes a hormone called relaxin that actually softens these joints making them much more pliable and elastic. The pelvis can then stretch open for the baby to pass through. There is also a fourth joint at the coccyx that will allow that little bone to flex back and away for the baby's passage. Surely we can all say with the psalmist, Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. As we consider how the Lord has provided for every step and stage of development, all the way through the delivery, we can take a spiritual lesson. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 1, 6, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is not going to leave you with an unfinished work. So long as you cooperate with Him, He will bring you to completion. Join me next time for more on the divine design.